sorry. <laughs> yes, I'm Bibi Schroeder from the Netherlands, um, co-owner of the Bert Hellinger Institute. And um, already, I think in, in 2000, uh, when I was uh, starting doing family constellations and systemic work for myself, uh, there was a strange sentence coming to my mind saying, in 10 years, I think we don't need those constellations anymore. Although I love to do constellations. Um, but I thought already there, there's so much insights coming and knowledge coming from these uh, constellations we also can use without. And then in 2006, I started, I developed a training systemic pedagogy uh, based on these insights. So this is a training without constellations, doing systemic work for people who work with children, with students, with also in schools for adults, and also, of course, for, for parents. Um, before 2000, I was for 25 years a teacher in the vocational school for students from 16 years on. And since 2000, I quit my job and uh, I am fully in the Beth Hellinger Institute working systemic. So welcome here. And this is interesting. Where do I welcome you? Do I welcome you in your own room? Do I welcome you in my room? When we go to normally to a conference, uh, you sit in your car or in the train or even in a plane and you go to a big hall and there you will have a coffee together with a lot of people and then you come in a room. And now you are just sitting in your own room having a conference. So, have a look around in your room and let your room be part of you. And then look at the screen and look at all the people in all their rooms. And then let's find a way to go to a place together, perhaps beyond the screen, where we can meet each other, where I can meet you. And now you can perceive yourself. Just perceive without any judgments about it for how much percentage are you here? Are you present? Is this 50? Is this 20? Is this 80? Just perceive yourself. And it's okay. And then find out where is this other percentage of you? Is it attracted perhaps by the laundry machine, perhaps by your kids or your cat? And just be aware of where this percentage is. And now find a symbol in your desk or in your handbag. It can be a pen or whatever, and take the symbol. A symbol for this percentage of you and also this what is attracting part of you from being here. And it's totally okay. And lay down this symbol somewhere behind you, under your chair, on your desk, whatever. Give it a place. Give a place to your absent part. And now perceive your body, your heartbeat again. How do you sense, how do you feel now? Is it different when you gave the symbol as a, a place and you gave a place to the absent part? And perhaps 
even now you are more present, perhaps not, but just perceive. So, and this is actually what kids need. Moet ik hem opschrijven voor die plaatjes? I just ask my technical support something in Dutch. This is what kid, kids need. What kids need is that they can rely on the presence in the here and now. Wait a minute, I see something. That they can rely on the presence in the here and now of the adults. When they really can rely on that, they can be kids. And actually, we all, and especially kids, have a very basic instinct. A basic instinct is being animals of a herd. And being animals of a herd, we have this instinct saying three things. One, when there's danger, be sure that you are in the herd that you have a place in the herd, meaning that all the unexperienced animals are inside. And two, when there's danger, be sure everybody has his own place, unexperienced animals inside, and the experienced animals make a closed cordon around these unexperienced animals. Because the unexperienced animals are in panic and they just want to go out and then the lion has a very uh, easy meal. So, this is a kind of uh, strange lion wolf. It's uh, for every continent, so just a dangerous animal. This is the herd going there when there's danger, but someone is not there. Someone is not filling in and making close this cordon. So there's a big danger. And everybody of this whole herd feels this has to be filled in. So this is number three of this basic instinct. When there's danger, let's make that this cordon is closed. And when there is a gap, it will be filled in. So probably one of these goes there and closes the cordon. It's actually, this is going completely unconscious. Of course, with animals, I think, it's always unconscious or conscious. <laughs> um, but it is actually not this animal which goes in, but this instinct of the whole system says, fill in this vacuum, fill in this hole. So it's actually the vacuum which sucks in one of the ex unexperienced animals into this gap. And actually this is also going with, um, with human beings. Only there we have not a complete herd of 25 animals, but mostly we see the adults, the parents, the teacher as the herd. And children need that this adult, this herd is complete. So, it is very important that we can be there as complete persons. So first of all, like this exercise we did with this percentage, uh, know that you are complete here. And if you are not complete here, the most important thing is that you do not do as if. Just give the absent part a place and then it's okay. Then everything has a place 
and then the safety can be provided. No, first not. So, yeah, I have, oh, yeah, it's, it's, I have to do. I'm very old fashioned. I don't work with PowerPoints. I just work with paper and pencil. I like it. Actually, formerly I was a drawing teacher. You don't see that on my drawings, but uh, I like uh, pencil and paper. So how can you or your system be sensed as not complete? Because it's, we, we think we are complete. I'm, I have a body, I have a head, but already being aware of your body is so important. These children are looking here. If you are only with your head, they don't see you. They see your belly. So please be aware of your whole body, of your feet on the ground, of your whatever you bring. And that's the thing I want to talk about, whatever you bring, your whole background. So long also in the systemic world, uh, we thought that completeness is about people. But more and more we got insights, it is about history. It's about history of those people, the history of the family, but also the history of the country, for example, the history of the whole culture, the history of a school, of an organization. And you know, this history, this system wants to be complete. So I always compare it with a history book. So imagine you are a history book, make yourself representative of a history book. And when I make myself a representative of a history book, I really want to have all the history in my book. It will be a thick book with all the facts in it in chronological order and not the history from one perspective or the other perspective. No, just all the facts, what happened until now. But we have a strange way of dealing with our life confrontations with events. When I am confronted with a painful or shameful event, then it's a very good way of surviving, of living on to tear out this page of the history book and to do as if this history was never happened and is not there and I throw it away. And for me, and perhaps also for my family, this is often the best survival strategy. And without doing that, people could perhaps not survive. So it's not a bad or a good thing, it's just a way of surviving. So when, for example, the grandmother is raped by her father, probably nobody speaks about it. And probably grandma survives by suppressing her feelings. And then later on, she will get children. These children, every child has antennas. His antennas for what is not here, what is not complete, what is absent, what is missing. And these children immediately feel <gasps> here is something, but never talk about because then my mother will not survive. And this, this is again, this basic instinct. It's perhaps unconscious. I, I really, I mean, myself, I, since my mother died 10 years ago, and my father too, I realized that there were topics. Now I would actually have asked them, but it came never in my mind to ask them. It was just the survival mechanism taken over by my by myself as a child 
And because when parents do not survive, the children also cannot survive. So the children know they have to follow the survival patterns. So the children of this grandma, no, don't speak about it. And then they get children. So the grandchildren of this grandma, they also feel there is something. But now there is this system force, this system conscience, which says, hey, wake up. There are grandchildren. This is a proof that we all survived. So stop surviving and go on living. And now this is the strange way of the system conscience. It just not says this, but it takes one of the children and gives it strange behavior. And this strange behavior is actually this indicator of there is still a torn out page which has to brought back to the history book. So strange behavior is behavior is strange because it is not reacting on the here and now. Strange behavior because we adults cannot understand why he or she behaves like that. Even sometimes you cannot understand why you yourself behaves like that. So when there's strange behavior, now we can think about, ah, this strange behavior points to look somewhere for the adults. Actually, this is the function of children. They have to, to educate the teachers, uh, the, the adults to look where the strange behavior is pointing at. And now I want to explain this picture. When this, this purple lines are the life, how it is coming through us, through the grand, great grandparents, the grandparents, the parents, and then it flows into us. But sometimes something was not allowed to go through, or it was suppressed, like the feelings of the grandmother were suppressed, or there was something so shameful in the family that we tear out this page. So what now immediately happens when a child needs a complete person, it, these antennas immediately feel, sense again, something is missing. And then something strange happens, but it is completely unconscious and innocent in a way, but please don't translate it that the child does it conscious. It is in going unconsciously in a way the child says, well, let's give it in my backpack. I am strong enough to carry this if you cannot carry this. This is the kind of uh, way how it goes, but unconscious. And this is exactly what we do not want to give to our children. So this is the paradox. If we say we will do it different than our parents, then in a way we say, I will block this. But, and we, we know all these examples, what we do not want to go to your children, the children connect with. So when you don't like your mother, you often see this, the children uh, are resembling this, like this mother. So, I will do a, an experiment. And please, I hope you have a paper and a pen. 
loose paper, small paper. And take a moment for yourself and write down on your paper in some words, nobody has to read it, it's only for yourself. Write down the painful or shameful, unbearable facts of your history. It can be your family history, it can also be your, the history of your country, for example. You don't have to think long for it. It will pop up. And when nothing pops up, you can think about what am I fighting? What do I really do not want or allow to be in existence? So write down this, do it for yourself. So when you wrote down these words, even if you are not sure about it, but just have some words, fold your paper close, as close as possible, six times, and make a very small thing of it, and give it a place somewhere on your desk. And then I will continue a little bit about this sucked in a vacant position. But now from the perspective of the adults. So we adults, we can have an adult age and still be in this sucked in position as a child. So often we still have these child illusions of, for example, having keeping together our parents also when the parents were already divorced for 40 years or that this sucked in position this in this vacant position gave us the illusion or perhaps the life task to give grandma a better youth than she had so these child illusions often are trying to repair the past. And this makes again that we adults often are not complete in the here and now, in the present. And child antennas immediately feel it's not present, danger, we have to carry, we have to fill in. So now reflect a little bit. I said this was an experiment. How was it during the last minutes that I continued after you filled down this paper? Could you hear me? Could you follow me? Did you bring a lot of attention to not seeing these torn out pages? Or were you completely absorbed by it, like a pink elephant in the room? Just reflect a bit and perceive yourself and perceive your body, perceive your heartbeat, for example. And think about, by folding this back, did I repeat the pattern of putting away this part of the history? Or was it actually already a process of coming in the conscious mind? 
So now I want to do an exercise with you in a kind of ritual. And perhaps it can be painful. And first, I want to explain it to you. And I go through the whole process. And then later on, we will uh, then you, if, if you want, you can turn off your camera then. And then I guide you by sentences through this process. I have to bring it a little bit back. Yes. So please take your paper again and unfold. It. And keep the paper in your hand and imagine that you can, uh, it is just an explanation, so you don't have to do it, just listen first. And imagine that there is a representative of, for example, this event, which is written on the paper, or representatives of the people involved. Or when you are fighting against something, it's just a representative of that what you fight. And then we go to a process. And perhaps this process is painful. And if you can, for example, only do the process until here, it's OK. Don't force yourself. But perhaps you can see it as an exercise. And you can go a little bit farther. But I don't want you to force, but I go through the whole process. So. Actually, the process is to say out loud, and this is important. So you are all unmuted. Uh, uh, so you are all muted. So nobody will hear you. So you can just say it out loud, and it is yes, yes, you, and then the name of what is on your paper exist. This can be yes, you betrayal, you exist. Yes, you are part of our history. Yes, you belong to us. And I allow you to exist. And uh, later on, I will do it slower so that you have time to say it out loud. I allow you to have a place in our and in my history. I give you a place, also when others cannot give you a place. Yes, I agree. And then with the last sentence, I give you a place in my heart. Try if it is possible, if you are already ready for doing this, but if you can Put this paper and bring this paper to your heart, saying, I give you a place in my heart. So if you want, you can turn off your camera now. And unfold your paper. Take it in your hands. And perhaps for the next process, you want to close your eyes, but perhaps you also can imagine with staring eyes that there is a representative standing somewhere in your room, a representative of that, what is said, written on your paper. This can be persons, this can be an event, an aspect, this can be more people. Or for example, when you fight something, this can be a representative of, for example, child abuse, racism, whatever. And when you see this representative, try to look at the representative. And if the representative has eyes, look him or her or them in their eyes. 
and then say out loud on a sigh, on a exhale, yes. And then, yes, you exist and name the one. Yes, you are part of our history. Yes, you belong to us and I allow you to exist. And take all the time you need to let it sink in. But I also go through this process. So go on and find out if the sentences will sink in later. I allow you to have a place in our and in my history. I give you a place also when others can not. Yes, I agree. And now take this paper consciously in your hand and by saying the next sentence, bring this to your heart. I give you a place in my heart. and perceive your body. How is your body reacting? Probably there's a lot of reaction inside. The reaction of becoming disloyal to the patterns of not being in contact with this part of the history. And become aware of your heartbeat. And then please turn on your camera again. And look at all the faces in your screen when you make a gallery view. And let you be seen to all the people in this conference with your complete history and go on breathing and be aware of your heartbeat and of your whole body. Actually, this is taking in your adult position. This is leaving the child illusions Actually, this is systemic maturity. And I want to say some, some an, uh, example. There was one of the teachers in the teacher training in systemic pedagogy. And during those two days, I saw there was something almost exploding in her. And then all of a sudden she said, I have to say something. I totally forgot. Also when we made our genogram, I totally forgot that I had an abortion. And I feel this abortion, I have to do something with it now. And then actually we did, we did a consolation, but we actually did the same process. 
and during after this constellation and after this process um the next one and a half day she was more and more yeah it's it's so strange sometimes you can see the the color of the skin is different and she became really in her maturity and then on monday <laughs> she uh contacted me and said i have to say something she is a teacher of a kindergarten and there was a boy and she brought in already the behavior of this boy the, the former time uh, because he had strange behavior and um, well almost offending behavior to her and she said well in the morning this boy came to me and he had a doll a baby doll in his hands he came to me he almost threw this baby on my lap and said here's your baby take care of it and then he turned around and he went on playing uh, again when i talk about it it's so touching the children immediately feel that this baby now had a place in her heart and he could leave it with her. These children are so miraculous in sensing what is missing, what needs a place. So this is again this drawing. Actually, what he did, he gave back this in order that this one just com could be part of her history. So when we have our torn out pages just somewhere in the history book, or would be best just at the page of the history book where it was torn out, then actually the history book can be closed and can go on with the history we are making now and now and now in the future. So when this torn out page has its place, the whole system can relax. And then also the strange behavior can relax. And often we see that slowly when the behavior really can rely, has it a place, the behavior can withdraw. And we will often see it. And perhaps something like autism or ADHD, it will not disappear. But as soon as the parents or the teacher look with this kind of eyes, it's completely different. And there, there is already happening a lot. And also when you see strange behavior and you have no clue where is this behavior pointing at i i have no idea what what page wants to be get a have a place you still can look with these kind of eyes these eyes who say well i don't know where you're pointing at but i will do my homework and i know that there is something which needs a place and often looking with these eyes, you make already a major difference. And then children can leave it to you. So it's not necessary to say anything because children, they don't need that. They just feel it and it's unconscious. So please don't bother children with this kind of knowledge. It's just for the adults, for the people who have an adult age. And as soon as the children do not have to spend all their energy to carry this or to fill in the gaps or to bring home the pages, then they can use this energy for learning, and for playing and for making social contact. So from now on, we can teach ourselves when we are confronted with strange behavior of children, of students, of adults, of ourselves. Just before we correct the behavior, please first look 
with the behavior where something needs to have a place. Then children are free for playing and for learning. So this was my talk. I think I, yes, I showed you all the pages. And um, I will give time for questions and I will sit down then. And no, so, this is it. So, so Bibi, a question that comes out is, if a torn out page is never acknowledged, does history repeat itself in the next generation? And this comes from Reggie. Well, Reggie, I'm sure you are thinking about something of your own, of your own history. Is that true? Can you unmute yourself, Reggie? Um, yeah, yes and no. It, I was thinking personal and I was thinking uh, the history of the country as well. Yes. So can you please repeat uh, the question again? Uh, the question is, if, if the turnout page is not acknowledged, does it keep on? Um, because obviously then you don't get a chance to achieve um, uh, the system maturity. So does it keep on repeating itself until such time um, it is acknowledged? Um, yeah. Yeah. And I immediately feel and see also the sadness of the answer you know already. It is yes, it will be repeat itself. And also this repeating we have to acknowledge. And this is, of course, what we all know, yesterday it was mentioned too, that we really have to leave everybody's fate to them. And we have to, to grant their fate. So what we often see when something is repeated, 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 for example, for already four generations, that the the call of the of the system conscious becomes stronger and often we see for example when there are physical pains or really mental illnesses then you can think about this is already a long pattern going on for example when it was necessary to survive to suppress your feelings or to please completely torn out, tear out your feelings or the feelings of this great, great grandmother, for example. And it becomes the pattern to be disconnected from your feelings. Then, well, of course, you can imagine this can become very intelligent people. And often you see if this is going on longer and longer and longer, they have become very intelligent autistic people. And sometimes you see also different ways of reacting of the system. For example, when feelings were disconnected for a long time, and all of a sudden there becomes a high sensitive child. And then this high sensitive child is not understood because nobody knows how to deal with feelings. And how long it is already, we all can work on acknowledging, acknowledging the pages. And I'm so aware of you being South African and me being Dutch and how our histories are connected in such a painful way and how we suppressed and even sold people from Africa. And how actually we Dutch were one of the best 
slave traders. And now the strange thing is we, I, I'm often ashamed by it. Often when I meet foreign people, they always say, oh, these Dutch people are so tolerant. Hmm. This is the cover up of the shame. And it's still the shame of our country, which we not completely can acknowledge. And I think systemic work can do things and more and more people find out how important it is to acknowledge and to acknowledge the reality and not make it nicer than it is. And that's so painful. So it's not an answer, but a reaction. <laughs> Thank yeah. you, Reggie. Thank you. Or do you want to comment something? Um, yeah, you know, um, no, thank you. Um, you know, I'm thinking about it, and I'm glad you addressed the, the country one because that's the one that's at the top of, 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 of my mind. Um, that um, how, do we, how do we move? You know, because, you know, the, the mere fact that we're not, we're not uh, the one side in particular is not acknowledging. Um, and I'm thinking about the consequences of, of, of that on the victim because the victim gets stuck as well. They're not able to move. So you need to be released of that. How do you move forward as a country? You know, because it, it, you might look at it in, 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 in terms of a whole country, but individually you get to experiences, um, you know, when you encounter people from opposite, opposite sides. How, yeah. how do we break free of that, you know, on, yeah. on a one-to-one -one basis? Yeah, well, actually, I, I just have to think about uh, the, my calendar with uh, every day a quote. And yesterday it was our liberation day. And the quote was, to make a war, you only need one. To make peace, you need at least two. Mm. And this is what you said. It's so difficult to make peace when the victim stays in the victim position. Mm. It, it really takes courage to make peace because making peace means that victim and perpetrator look in each other's eyes. And actually it's the victim who can reach out. It's so difficult for the perpetrator to reach out because as immediately when the perpetrator reaches out to make peace, the victim becomes a perpetrator by rejecting. So that's the difficulty with perpetrators and victims. It is not one is the victim and the other is the perpetrator. It, both are involved in this uh, polarities of victimship and perpetratorship. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, this can turn around. For example, when a criminal is co uh, comes in a prison, I always think about, is he still a perpetrator or is it a victim? So then immediately it turns around. Mm -hmm. And often you can see perpetrators started as victims. So it's, this is a complete different topic about perpetrator and victimship. So thank you. Thank you for that. So it's, it's really food for thought. Thank you. Thanks, Bibi. So Bibi, uh, I've got a question from Malik Amari. He, he asks, he says the missing page why is it obliged to be a negative story? Maybe we're also missing some positive pages. Mm -hmm. So that's Malik Amari who asked the question. Yeah. Who reflected on that. Well, it's just because I thought, uh, I thought about this uh, survival mechanism. The to survive when there is some 
awful, painful, shameful event, then we have this tendency to tear out this page because this is just a very good way to survive, to do as if it not happened. Mostly we do not do this with nice events because we want to remember the nice events. That's just why. Yeah. Thank you. And um, Linda asks a question about when you see strange behavior in the classroom, is it, does it, is it, the, is it the teacher that is missing or is it the parent that holds that? Yeah, yeah that's an interesting question always. And you never know. But for sure, the first thing you can do is to find out, am I complete? with how much vacuum do I live? How many things I want not to bring with me? And well, if you see often, for example, we, we all know this phenomenon that there is a classroom and, or, or there's a, a class uh, a group and, um, there's awful behavior, for example, bullying. And then these two or one are going to another school. And then the bullying happens again with other children. So then for sure you can think about it is something having to do with the school, with the teacher, with the team, but perhaps even with the board of the school. And I saw with a lot of consolations about bullying that bullying is not only a bully and a bullied one. Bullying as a phenomenon involving the whole classroom is the reaction on the disorder in the organization. And this can be the disorder in the teacher. Mostly it is the disorder in the team and often it has to do that for example the teachers have judgments about the management or have judgments about the ministry of education or have judgments about the parents or the society and that's the system when you have judgments you make yourself bigger than that what you judge so then you bring yourself on a position in an order which is not your position. And then you have this, uh, this herd again. Hello, where is he? Then you bring yourself even out of the system when you have judgments. So, First of all, you can think about yourself. And the other thing is when you look at a child and we all learn this from, uh, I learned it from, uh, from Marianne Franke. Look at a child with their background, with their parents and with all their history, including their torn out pages, their black pages. Everybody has this incomplete history book, but with when you look with eyes who can see all these gaps in the system, you make already a container, you make already a bigger, com more complete system. And then the child is safe with you. As soon as you have judgments about, oh, these parents, they, uh, they really have to do some systemic work because they, uh, they uh, have judgments about them, uh, about the father, the missing father or whatever. Immediately, you will close the system. And then the child has to defend himself. So also when there is something missing at the background of the, ch of the child, at the parents, we as teachers can open our heart for whatever is missing. And then exactly the same happens as in the very beginning of when you made this symbol for the absent part and you give it a place and then it sends this more complete. Nice. Thanks, Bibi.
So, Vivian, we've got time for one more question, and it's a really lovely question from Sylvia Serret. And she says, one thing I didn't find clear when Bibi talked about strange children's strange behavior, you don't talk to the child about it, but you talk to the parents. Or do you possibly educate parents about the systemic view in order to get them thinking? So that's from Sylvia Serret. So I don't know, Sylvia, if yeah. you want to... So Sylvia, can you please come in? Can you unmute yourself? Yeah, hello. Ah, hello. So in, in one sentence, what's your question? So um, it, it became a bit clearer with the things you said, just, uh, just the last things you said. Um, so I think I have an idea now. So I think I've probably answered my question myself there. I think it's it's important to do that as a parent slash teacher slash leader. Um, look at view that person that you care about and care for in that way and and the person can relax and has a safe container. I totally get that. Uh, so and I think it is probably a good idea to offer educational um talks and spread the systemic thought in order to get other people thinking but leave it to them because of course you can't and don't want to change anyone yes yes for sure and you you say it already it is not only for children also when you have a conflict with a colleague you think why is he or she behaving so strange well probably there's something reflecting on me or uh, projected on me but you can already reflect on yourself am i complete or am i closing something yeah very helpful thank you so much thank you and sorry Bibi, just one one Ali has a reflection and I think it'll be nice just to finish off with it. He says, feeling very reflective now about the school I worked in and also about how I bring myself to different situations. My perception of not belonging has been, has had a really impact on my professional life. So the one who asked this can finish. You should come in. Miss Ali, Martin, would you like to come up? Ali? Can you unmute yourself? Hello. Okay. Ah, hello. Yes, hello. Yes, yeah, so Ellie, you, sorry. Got an, you got an insight about not belonging? Yes. Yeah, I did. I did. And I realized that that because of things that have happened in the past, I've carried that perception through to all, lots of different settings and have perceived that I haven't felt like I belonged, even though that's a perception rather than the reality. And that having been, having been, I suppose, asked about that, had never really understood what it was. They'd obviously perceived something in me that I was bringing and I didn't know what it was until now. And now I have that moment of insight and I now get it. Well, great. Yeah. great. And, and you know, it's so important not to judge about no. for yourself. Because probably you came on the place of somebody who did not belong. Yes. So Absolutely. all your love, although it was unconsciously, all your love was in connecting that one to remember. Mm. But the, the prize of it was that you felt not belonging. Mm. And then the reaction of the others is, Hmm, this one is not belonging. Let's do it alone. And yeah. then it's, for example, difficult to cooperate with, with your colleagues. Yes. Mm. So welcome, Ellie. Thank you. Thank you. And you belong Thanks. to us. <laughs> Thank you. So, so Reggie, if you're ready oh, to... Uh, really, no. Ellie, look at your face now in the screen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But this is the advantage of seeing because often in a, in a workshop, I I say something like, "Oh, I would have a mirror now. I would like to have a mirror now because your face is completely different now." Hmm. Enjoy. Yeah, I see that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. 
Yeah. Thank you. So I think time-wise we are done. Yeah, um, Bibi, thank you. Thank you uh, uh, so much for a thought-provoking um, a session. I think it gives us a lot, a lot to think about. Um, uh, it, it's an amazing topic uh, that you're dealing with. Personally, I think we, we most definitely need the whole day, one day to go through all this, or even the weekend, wherever, whichever country. Well, um, I have a training of uh, eight days. Oh, oh. <laughs> so, no, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, we really appreciate that. Um, and now we're going to be going on a, a short break. May I say one thing? Okay. Um, shall I put my email address in the chat? Because if people are yeah. touched with and want to ask still something or want to be in touch, feel free to make contact. That'll be fantastic. Thank you so much. We, we really appreciate that.